it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. To get to grips with the stories that really matter. To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Welcome to the show. Uh, we have lots coming up this afternoon. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. We're with you for the next two hours discussing the big stories of the day. Yes, this is a cross talk. Uh, lots coming up over the next couple of hours. Obviously quite a busy weekend. <laughs> Wasn't it just, indeed? Uh, coming up, uh, Israel's allies have urged uh, uh, Israel to avoid any escalation as it considers a response to Ir Iran's unprecedented missile and drone attack over the weekend. And 543 migrants crossed the channel yesterday alone, a record amount for a single day this year. Uh, and Donald Trump's long-awaited hush money trial is due to get underway in New York this morning. All of that is coming up and a lot more, but first, let's get the news headlines with Natalia. Good afternoon. A bishop and several other people have been injured after a stabbing during a church service in Sydney. Local media reports the incident took place while a sermon was being streamed online. It is the second mass stabbing to take place in one of Australia's largest cities in the last 48 hours after six people were killed on Saturday. The shopping centre knife attacker deliberately targeted women, police have said. Joel Couchy's father has apologised for his son's actions and says he was a tormented soul and doesn't blame the police officer who shot him dead. You'd like to think Australia is a very safe country. Uh, you know, a lot of people are proud of this country for being such a safe uh, place to live, but this has put a lot of doubt in people's minds and questioning whether it is safe. Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron says Iran's attack on Israel was a total failure and is urging Israel not to retaliate. G7 leaders condemn the weekend barrage of missiles and drones. However, despite Israel's Western allies appealing for Israel to show restraint, a government spokesman said it's up to Israel to decide how to defend its people. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres is also urging for calm. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. Three men have been killed and one is critically injured after a car crash in North London. Police say they were called to a road traffic accident in Brent Cross late last night. Five men in their 20s were inside the vehicle at the time and no other cars were involved. Donald Trump will enter a New York court later, making him the first U.S. former president in history to stand trial in a criminal case. The 77-year-old is accused of falsifying business records to disguise hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. He could face up to four years in jail if convicted. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty. A leading think tank says universal credit must change to meet the needs of an older and sicker population. According to the Resolution Foundation, 2.3 million people are now out of work because of poor health. That's nearly double since the benefit scheme was introduced 11 years ago. 
And Sunset Boulevard has dominated the Olivier Awards, winning seven of its 11 nominations. Leading duo Tom Francis and Nicole Scherzinger won the awards of Best Actor and Best Actress in a Musical. Super overwhelming, um, but I'm so grateful. And I'll probably, after this tonight, go home and cry <laughs> for a long time. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, we've seen some very wet, very windy weather clearing its way southwards this morning. Much of that has now gone, but instead we'll see showers and some of these will be quite potent too. Indeed, they'll turn wintry over the higher ground of Scotland, parts of Wales and indeed the Pennines. And there's a yellow warning out for strong winds for much of England and Wales, Northern Ireland too. We could see gusts to 50, 55 miles per hour, possibly even 60 miles per hour. Now, it's not going to be a warm day. Temperatures really only just making it into double figures. And with that wind, it'll feel chillier still. And so the course of this evening and overnight, the showers become a little more confined to these eastern areas and towards the north and the west, becoming dry elsewhere. So another cold night to come, potentially sub-zero in parts of the north. But through the course of Tuesday, it's going to be those eastern coasts that stay very cloudy with further rain and uh, showers. These working their way southwards through the course of the day, eventually they come to linger over parts of East Anglia and the southeast. And here, of course, as it stays windy, it will feel very chilly as well. Meanwhile, we start to see some sunshine appearing inland and out towards the west. Temperatures around 13 Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Uh, welcome back. Uh, yeah, the big story of the weekend obviously was the massive attack by Iran on Israel. The first such attack uh, in the Middle East, uh, a direct attack by the old enemy on the old enemy. So obviously that will dominate a lot of our discussions uh, today. But uh, another big story quietly emerged yesterday, uh, Alex. And uh, by the way, uh, really pleased to be joined in the studio by the executive director of the Henry Jackson Society. He is our presenter's very good friend, Dr. Alan Mendoza. Thank you for joining us, Alan. Uh, what I'd like to have a quick chat about is yesterday, very quietly uh, 534 migrants came across the channel that is a world record for this year and of course it was a very nice weather weekend and uh, I suspect if we get a summer like the weekend we've just had the numbers are going to be astronomical aren't yeah they? this is this problem's not going to go anywhere it's going to keep on continuing not least of course because it's part of the bigger picture of everything we are seeing happening around the world today and we still haven't got a grip on the whole problem in fact the Rwanda bill Rwanda's a safe country remember that it's now in legislation well that's bouncing around the House of Lords in its final week of playing a parliamentary ping pong amongst the peers uh, but I think that the jury is still very much out on whether or not a single flight will take off and and whether or not there'll be anybody on any of the flights. They can't even find an airline now to be the transitor for these people because Rwanda's own flag carrier said, no, 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 we don't want that. We've had pressure put on us not to take part in that. A Maltese airline were in the running to deport people to Rwanda. Um, that's not going to happen either. So every single time that we think we're getting closer, there's yet another obstacle in the way. And the bleeding hearts are still extremely worried because, of course, all of these people are poor refugees who we must accommodate. How naive can we be that's uh, it's one for easy jet isn't it alan do you think <laughs> well it's one for anyone who's going to take the, the the people in this sort of way look i think the rwanda uh, bill is essential to this i mean i think you know we, we can see that doing nothing will lead to record numbers that's quite obvious um so you know whatever you think of the rwanda bill it's the only idea that's actually been put on the table that has some chance of making a difference i suspect and, and by the way i read a fascinating story that one charity is now trying to recruit loads of volunteers to go round to migrants to save them from being deported the minute they find out who's on there they're going to offer them legal aid and everything else 
else. So people are being undermined. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the government's being undermined. The strategy for the country is being undermined by people. These these you know alleged do gooders, but people are actually uh, doing bad because yeah. they are encouraging gaming the system. Why is it that so many people just seem willingly to go along with this idea that everybody who's getting on a boat and crossing the channel is from a war-torn country, are facing persecution, that they desperately need our protection? Why can't they understand that this is a huge international criminal uh, uh, organisation or criminal pursuit, essentially, in part being uh, corralled and coordinated by enemies of the country? Well, because I don't think they want to understand, Alex. What, what, what you're looking at these people, what they're saying is essentially, look, any refugee, as far as we're concerned, or any migrant, is a good person. Doesn't matter who they are, where they're from, how it works, they're inherently better because I imagine that it fits into their worldview, a very woke worldview, that Britain is inherently bad, the whiteness of Britain's a disaster, we need to change that, and as a result, they don't care about who's legitimate and who's not, they just want the people in the country as they think it's a good thing to have that level of diversity. Well, it's not. We want people who, we obviously want to cater for genuine um, asylum seekers, and we want, you know, those migrants who fit our skill sets and needs that we need in this country. We do not want untrammeled immigration and we don't want people gaming the asylum system. Yes, I've got two words uh, for people who say that all migrants are good. Abdul and Ezidi. Try those two words. And I then, thought you were going to pick two other words. Thank and then Kevin. come back to me. The others. Yeah, and then come back to me and tell me that all migrants are good. They're not. No, quite. Uh, but uh, of course, as I said earlier, the big, big story of the day is Israel, Israel and Iran. That massive attack at the weekend. Uh, more than 300 drone bombs and missiles launched on Israel. The defence system held up well, but nevertheless, it's an un unprecedentedly uh, aggressive action by Iran directly on Israel, and frankly, the world is holding its breath. Does this escalate or does it not? Uh, so our question to you, uh, quite simply, we'd like to hear what uh, you think, is after Iran's massive attack... Should Israel retaliate? Uh, because, of course, a lot of people, Cameron, of course, and uh, Sunak and Biden, all urging Israel uh, to leave it at this, not to retaliate, to just uh, chalk it up as a kind of semi-win because none of these missiles got through to Israel. Uh, but uh, Netanyahu and the gang, of course, are saying, well, we're not going to allow people to... Just to uh, attack our country. So, want to hear from you. After Iran's massive attack, should Israel retaliate? Uh, you can give us a call 0344 499 1000, or you can text us right talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222, uh, or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. Uh, but uh, before uh, we uh, find out what you think about all of this, uh, we need to discuss. The situation generally, as I said, we've got uh, world experts on the region, Dr. Alan Mendoza in the studio. But uh, a warm welcome now uh, to our first guest, defence security and military analyst, uh, Simon Diggins, OBE. Welcome, Simon. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh What is your, I mean, you know, a lot of people saying to Israel, oh, don't react, don't react, don't retaliate. Uh, I mean, that might be the statesmanlike thing to do. But I'm thinking if I was an Israeli and my country had just been attacked by more than 300 missiles from an enemy state, as in Iran, I might not want a complacent reaction on the part of my prime minister. I might want something aggressive. Uh, how do you think it's going to play out realistically? Will Netanyahu retaliate, Simon? It does depend how much he's prepared to listen to those who have supported him and those who are urging him inside the country to, as you say, to to uh, re retaliate. Um, it, and that's a very moot question. I mean, it, the, it is interesting that the, the, sort of like the, the Court of World Opinion has rightly condemned Iran's attack, but has also then urged restraint. And it's everybody from all the G7 countries, the, the Secretary General of the United Nations, and indeed President Biden himself, who said very clearly, take the win. And I think the win is interesting. It's not just the tactical defeat of this uh, operation, but look what to actually achieve that defeat. They managed to get Sunni Arab countries, albeit ones who have had their own problems with Iran, they managed to get Sunni Arab countries to cooperate in defeating this. You had Jordanians attacking those drone missiles. You had Saudi providing intelligence. You had Emirati providing intelligence. All of those countries who are no friends of Iran, but also find themselves in a very a strained position now with relation to what's happening in Gaza, all those countries 
participated and cooperated together to defeat this Iranian aggression. Now, that was a strategic win. That's a strategic win. That's not just knocking a few missiles out of the sky. That's actually getting people together in a very difficult time with everything else that's going on in Gaza. Nonetheless, they came together and supported Israel. And the question I think for Netanyahu is, do I, if I like, give, give way to a, a perfectly legitimate and perfectly understandable desire for some kind of revenge, or do I actually take this, not just the, 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 the tactical defeat, but the strategic win? And I think that's why people are urging to restrain. You know, you've achieved something really extraordinary here. You brought all those countries together to support you against this particular attack. Hang on to that, build on that, and don't give way to to the desire to uh, carry out some kind of retaliatory revenge attack because they will not support you. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because that was my big take home from this weekend. How remarkable it was, in fact, to see the Arab world coming together with the West in order, frankly, to defend Israel. And there may be elements of legacy proxy wars between the Shias and the Sunnis involved in that. But I think also the Gulf states have just had enough of this. They want five-star hotels and resorts. They want world-leading airlines. They want to host sports competitions. They don't want to be dragged back into the mad theocratic wars of their troublesome neighbours, who, frankly, they don't like. Um, but when it comes to Israel's response, do you think there still will be some sort of response, even if it isn't sort of frenetic and kinetic, something, again, a bit more targeted to weaken Iran while it's been found to be a pariah state? Because, frankly, the mood music I've heard coming out of the EU so far on this is not to do anything, not even to impose sanctions on Iran. And yet, you know, if they don't do something, one could argue that they've gotten away with it. No, I think there's something in that. In a sense, what we might end up with is, if, is it like a return to what we've had prior to these this attack, or actually this exchange of attacks, the Israeli attack on the on the Iranian consulate uh, in, in Damascus, and then this response by 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 the Iranians. There has been a sort of low level war by proxy, war by discreet assassination ongoing now for a number a number of years, and obviously heightened slightly during this period after October the seventh and the attack by by Hamas. Uh, and I think what we will see definitely is a kind of return to that. Uh, there's also conversations ongoing around whether or not the IRGC, who are the, the military arm of the Iranian state, are carrying out a lot of these, uh, these operations, or at least doing the training or mentoring, educating, guiding, intelligence, whatever you want to describe their, their role in there, and whether they, they will be fully prescribed as a terrorist organisation, which I notice we're still... Uh, havering over at, at the moment. So I think a short answer to your question is, yes, we will see a return to that, but it may not be a kind of direct, very much, you know, all trumpets blaring uh, retaliation as some people in Israel are asking for. Uh, where do we stand, Simon, when uh, the President of the United States, uh, traditionally the all-powerful voice in the Middle East, is frankly being ignored. I mean, Netanyahu isn't listening to him all that much at the moment. And uh, when he issued his instructions for Iran in terms of their retaliation uh, that happened at the weekend, uh, he, uh, the president said, uh, was asked, uh, should it, what would your advice to Iran be in terms of this attack? He said, don't, don't and was completely ignored. So both Iran and Israel don't seem to be paying much attention to the secretary, uh, or rather the president of the United States. Does that not uh, make the situation in the Middle East somewhat precarious when we have such a weak president that no one listens to him? I think what it does indicate is the way in which, if I influence the United States and its power is no longer what it was. And I think it, that does make for a more complicated, more dangerous world. Uh, and one which we, as a, our own country, need to need to adjust to. We can't assume that you know we have a Pax Americana that seems to ha have disappeared. It's very it's been fraying at the edges for a number of years. I think really ever since you know the the withdrawal from from Afghanistan uh, and the very messy situation being left behind uh, in, in Iraq. Um, uh, the days when a U.S. president could just say don't both to a, a friendly country, in, his, in the case of Israel, and to an opponent country in Iran and be listened to, I think, I think are over. 
And so we are now in a more complicated, more, more, more dangerous world. Iran's response was very much in order to save face after Israel, uh, I think, quite rightly took out the, the, the general of their Quds force. Of course, I mean, not spoken about enough in Western media. The man, frankly, responsible for arming and training all of those terrorist proxy entities from Hezbollah to the Houthis to Hamas, of creating all the instability in the region. Um, but rather than save face, one could say that Iran has egg on their face. They look even more like a pariah nation. Do you think Iran expected all of their drones and their missiles to be intercepted before they could land? Or do you think that has been a massive failure? I think it's, it's, I think it's a bit of a mixture. Um, Iran signalled quite heavily what it was going to do. Uh, it talked to the Iraqis, it talked to the Emirati, it talked to the Saudis, uh, and explained to them what they were going to do in advance. Probably in the very clear knowledge that that information was going to be passed on to to the Americans. And we saw it in the week before this attack, uh, General Carrillo, who is the general in charge of US Central Command, moving around the Middle East, coordinating this air defense effort. So there's an element where this whole thing was, is, if I dare say, slightly stage managed. This was a, what you might call a, a demonstration in response to a, a direct attack on, and I know they were occupied, the people who were in there were Al-Quds generals, but this was actually nonetheless sovereign Iranian territory. It's one of those conventions, a bit like the International Red Cross and Red Crescent conventions, that people people at least uh, give lip service to, that embassies, consulates and so forth are regarded as sovereign territory. And Israel decided for its own reasons uh, to ignore that convention and to attack that consulate uh, in Damascus. Some kind of response from Iran was almost certain to happen uh, after, after that. Uh, what they also were clear there is they didn't want this to go on over much. Uh, they very quickly said, even before the attack was finally launched, that this concluded the matter as far as they were concerned. And at other stage in this whole period since October the 7th, we've seen Iran trying to pull back uh, some of its proxies that when they when they felt the the Americans were going to intervene with them, uh, and there's again you know signalling to the Americans and the Americans signalling to them about what the limits of what they're trying to do. So there is an, at least an attempt to try and control and constrain this. The danger we now could put ourselves into with these 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 two this series of attacks is actually that control and constraint, however limited it is, and it's very porous. But nonetheless, the, those, those 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 limits existed will will disappear. I think that's what everyone's really worried about. Simon, thank you so much for your time. That's Simon Diggins. Thank there. you, Simon. We're still with uh, Dr. Alan Mendoza from the Henry Jackson Society. Uh, Alan, how much do you think? I mean, I think as far as I can work out, uh, Joe Biden's about the weakest president on the international stage that I've almost ever seen. He's certainly very weak in the Middle East. I mean, what kind of effect does that have on that volatile region? How different do you think it might be if, say, Donald Trump was president right now? Well, I mean, on the one hand, it's impossible to make the comparison because you never know which version of Donald Trump gets up in the morning. However, what we did see in the Trump period was, of course, um, A, in this case, absolute staunch support for Israel. And look, to be fair to Biden, he's given that. He's, been, he, he's done the same sort of defensive support. But I think the difference is in the offensive side of things. Donald Trump showed in January of 2020 that he was prepared to be offensive against Iran when he took out Qasem Soleimani, the terrorist-in-chief. And he did that, by the way, when the entire US security establishment was shocked that he chose that option. The options were put to him. It was the most radical option. He took it. I think the difference between Trump and Biden is that everyone understands that Biden will not take those offensive no, options. Sure. He's defence, defence, defence. And when you're defensive the whole time, it means that your opponents think they can keep on prodding at you in order to try and find that one weak link, that place mm. they can push you and push you around. And that's the problem with, with playing defence the whole time. I mean, despite the focus often being on America when it comes to playing peacekeeper and uh, how to react to international um, situations and crises, there are various other countries and entities who all have a huge amount of influence. I want to draw your attention to the EU, their security chiefs are meeting this week in Brussels to discuss what the reaction should be to what Iran has done. And yet, Joseph Burrell, who is the head of their foreign office, so to speak, has turned around and said, oh, let's not talk about sanctions against Iran. Let's not do that. Softly, softly, we need to have a diplomatic, open relationship with Tehran. That is the way to maintain peace. Yet, if you look at the EU trade statistics since 2015, when the JCPOA was back on the table, the Iran nuclear 
deal. The EU have been selling them tons of stuff, machinery, nuclear reactors, chemicals. It's no surprise, frankly, that the Iranian drones, which they also sell to Russia, now contain 40% of parts from Europe. Uh, do you think that they're still not getting this? Do you think people like Burrell, in many respects, actively enabling Iran to become more aggressive? Absolutely. I mean, you've highlighted a very important point. The fact is that that nuclear uh, deal has led to, you know, an, an upsurge in European trade with Iran. And that's, you know, gone down very well with European companies. And that, by the way, is the reason primarily why, despite Iran breaking everything in that deal since 2018, 2019, and basically enriching uranium to a nuclear level at this point, the Europeans have not come out of it. And I'm sorry to say that we, of course, are also a signatory to that deal. And we, too, mm. have not come out of it. And it makes a mockery of British and European diplomacy that we are sitting in a nuclear deal which has the facility for snapback sanctions when the other party breaks the rules as they have openly done for five six years now and we don't take that that is a weakness in our diplomacy and no wonder iran feels emboldened and enabled because it seems to think it can do anything and the europeans and the british will not put sanctions oh, on yeah it. the press here will just worry about the 0.1 percent of israel's army that comes from britain not the 40 percent of bits and bobs in iranian drones that are also coming from europe it is rather mad alan thank you very much you'll be uh, getting your thoughts on many other things after the break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Uh, lots still to come, uh, but uh, we are kicking off with the main story, of course, uh, 
that uh, shocking uh, raid over the weekend by Iran on Israel. More than 300 uh, missiles and drone bombs unleashed on Israel. The Israel defense systems work very well. They think 99% of all the attack missiles were stopped, but nevertheless, it is a definite uh, upgrading of aggression uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it is not often that Israel and or Iran directly attack each other. Uh, let's talk uh, to the editor of the jo Jewish Telegraph, uh, Paul Harris. Uh, thanks for joining us, Paul. Uh, I think the first big question is, uh, do you uh, expect or predict that Israel will retaliate uh, militarily against what happened at the weekend? Um, based on past history, I'd be very surprised if Israel does not retaliate. The attack by Iran was disproportionate uh, in response to um, Israel's bombing of its consulate. But uh, this was horrendous and it's a game changer in the Middle East. How do you think that they will respond? Do you think this is going to be a kinetic response? Uh, in other words, you know, a, a similar bombardment into Iran itself? Or do you think it would be more targeted and strategic and sort of picking off potentially military bases and, and certain generals and certain members of the IRGC? Yes, again, based on past history and what Israel tends to do, I, I would expect this to be targeted, um, aiming at specific military um, targets and possibly um, terrorists who they may have identified. Uh, but again, you know, I think the, the world can see that this is a very, very dangerous situation at the moment. Uh, indeed, uh, and a lot of countries, uh, it's, it seems to me if you are the Prime Minister of Israel, everybody in the world wants to tell you how to run your own country. I've never known a nation I like it. it. Oh, I think Israel must be about the only country in the world where other countries seem to uh, believe that they have a right to dictate what Israel does. This has gone on for years now, uh, including, of course, um, dictating where Israel's capital should be. It's the only country in the world which seems uh, not to be allowed to choose its own capital. So uh, this, this is quite normal, I think. Yeah, uh, and it must be irritating for the Israeli people. But what I'm getting at, Paul, is that if I lived in Israel, or indeed if I lived here in Britain and some foreign power had just rained more than 300 missiles down on my country, I think I might want, want my government to react, to retaliate, to tell these people, you can't do that to us. And yet the whole world is telling Netanyahu, allow yourself to be attacked by Iran and don't do anything about it. I think it goes against human nature. But to my question to you is, what are the Israeli people feeling right now? Do they want Netanyahu to retaliate or do they want him to exercise restraint? I think Israel, the, the average man in the street in Israel would expect its government to react in kind. Uh, I, I would think a softly, softly approach cannot be allowed under these circumstances because it will happen again. I think that Iran will just feel that Israel is a soft target then. And I very much expect that most Israelis would want their government to react um, militarily. There have been threats, of course, by Iran from the Ayatollah himself saying, well, look, that's put an end to it. You know, we had our go at you. Fine, you managed to stop all those missiles and drones, but that's it. We're not going to do anything else. If you dare respond again the second time that we come back at you, it will be really bad. And you know what that is. What do you think he means by that? We can only uh, suspect that we're talking about uh, a nuclear reaction, possibly. But... When you look at what could have happened at the weekend with these hundreds of missiles aimed at Israel, uh, I won't say it was miraculous that uh, there was, I think there was only one injury that I, I've come across, which was a baby, in fact. Um, but it wasn't miraculous. It was uh, mi militarily operated in such a way that they were neutralized. But I mean, what could have happened hardly bears thinking about. If Iran thought that when it was uh, 
curating those uh, October the 7th attacks, funding and arming Hamas and encouraging them and cajoling them into creating chaos once again in the region. If they thought that that was going to help break apart the relationship between Israel and its other neighbours and Israel and the West and the West and its other neighbours, they've kind of been proven wrong, haven't they? Because you're talking there about the military intervention that happened, that coordinated response to Iran launching all of those drones and missiles. And it was quite important, I think, to see uh, plenty of Arabic countries involving themselves, whether it was just allowing air bases to be used in their country, sharing intelligence, or even actually being part of bringing down some of those missiles and drones. And we're not actually looking at a situation where it's quite clear now Iran is a pariah state and actually... Uh, strangely, the Middle East and the rest of it looks almost sort of more together than it ever has been. Well, it, it certainly seesawed since October the 7th when there was initial um, sympathy from all parts for Israel after the attack. Uh, after that, of course, because of Israel's reaction in Gaza, there has been less support from some quarters. But I think, again, I think it's a swung in Israel's direction again because we're seeing that its Arab neighbors, who many of whom, most of whom have got no love for Iran, are actually, um, have actually helped to avoid this attack on Israel, as we know that they helped to destroy some of these incoming missiles. So I think possibly public relations has swung in Israel's favor again, uh, as far as some of its neighbors are concerned. Um, Dr. Alan Mandoza is still with us in the uh, studio. What, what are your view is the chances of this, uh, are the chances of this conflict escalating? I mean, I think it's very strange that the, the international community, if you like, have kind of sanctioned Iran to retaliate against that Israeli attack on their generals a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and you kind of get the impression that if Israel responded just once and a bit that would be okay. Uh, so we are kind of all watching kind of performance art in a way. Uh, and we're having demonstrated to us the real difficulty of trying to uh, constrain conflict. Uh, what do you think, Alan? Do you think this uh, flashpoint that's been happening now uh, will uh, just be a flashpoint and we'll return to normal or do you think uh, this has got the potential to escalate frankly up into world war three well it could of course be either of those eventualities what what we don't know sitting here is what the thoughts are within the israeli war cabinet how they're interplaying with the coalition of support that they got on saturday night and how far they're willing to push this to go forwards it seems quite clear to me that Israel has to, of course, respond to what happened. It was a direct state-on-state -state attack, and it wasn't just a casual thing. Uh, it was 300 to 350 missiles, yeah. bombs, other things coming our way. It sometimes makes me laugh to think about what people like Lord Cameron will be saying if Britain face that kind exactly. of that That's bombardment do you think they would i really wonder do you think they'd get up the next day and say look um we're gonna not do anything people of britain and what do you think the british reaction would exactly. be That's to that point. the general public here would go mad saying how, how can you allow this to stand now it's one thing if the international community says right we will take on this and we will punish the iranians we'll punish them with more sanctions we'll punish them with our gc prescription we're going to make their lives very miserable and grim but we're not seeing that either are we we're not seeing any approach there so israel's going to have to do something and the question about whether this escalates is what that something looks like and it could range anywhere from a cyber attack something uh, to a proxy one of the proxy iranian proxies to an attack on iran itself or even let's take out the nuclear program because the one thing that we can tell now is that israel has been quite right to point out the existential threat from an iranian nuclear bomb any country that lobs that number of missiles and and drones at you is clearly seeks to eradicate you and that's why the israelis cannot at any cost allow uh, iran to have a nuclear weapon yeah paul i'm going to come back to you on that i think alan makes an important point there which is that perhaps what we've seen now exposed i mean those of us who follow geopolitics have known that iran have been uh, a ne'er uh, ne do well for a very long time but perhaps Perhaps uh, this is now exposed and given the green light to saying to Iran once and for all, that's it, this stops now, and the West coming together to put Iran back in its box, so to speak. Yes, I, I would agree with that. Uh, but I, I do think that Iran would actually fear a full-scale Israel Israeli attack, because I think Israel has, has it within its power to do considerable damage 
Um, we all know that the might of the IDF, the Israel Defense Force, uh, it's one of the best armies, the best trained armies in the world. So I think with all the powers coming together, I think Iran has got a lot to fear. And I, I really do think there is going to be a response. And as you were rightly saying, um, can you imagine Britain just sitting there or the United States sitting back and saying, well, um, let's just de-escalate, just leave it alone. We've been under attack. So what? No, this, this won't happen. What are the chances, Alan, if there is a response and a response to the response? We find ourselves in a situation where we do then have kinetic warfare between Israel and Iran. And I think under those circumstances, even though our good friend Lord Cameron and uh, Joe Biden have both said, look, we're not going to help you in being an aggressor. They've both still tacitly said, but if you're under attack, we will be there. Could this therefore not just bring us into the theatre of war in the Middle East, but have effects and ramifications for us here in the UK? Yes, it certainly could. And I think it is right to point out that you know, the UK, the US have been very helpful to Israel defensively since October the 7th. They've been supportive. They've offered all kinds of assistance in that field. And Saturday night was a great example of that. And I suppose were there to be a significant war between the parties and you know, were Israel to, to face concerted attack, and on many fronts, given that Iran would uh, you know, unleash its proxies at that point, we would, I'm sure, come into that in defence of Israel uh, because we cannot allow Iran and its terrorist proxies to win. And that, of course, could lend itself, therefore, to terrorist activities on the streets of the UK. We know that we are riddled with Iranian agents and influence in the UK. We've seen that Iranian uh, journalists in exile have been attacked threatened. Uh, there have been other incidents here where we've seen the influence of Iran in the UK. Iran's got a network here, and I'm sure that if it felt that it you know, wanted to uh, action it, it could launch that network against uh, British people as well. So we've got to be mindful of that in that way. But that's not an excuse not to do something against this country. It's an excuse to say we've got to remove this threat, this malign influence uh, from, from our shores and from overseas as well. Uh, last question to you, Paul. Uh... How real is the nuclear threat from Iran? Uh, because, uh, you know, I've always thought, well, why doesn't Israel just take Iran on? With the help of the West, uh, it's much stronger. It could, blow, it could blow Iran off the face of the earth. It is stronger. Uh, but I guess the fear is, is just how advanced they are with their nuclear project. What is the feeling uh, among Israelis and Jewish people about that? Uh, just how... Uh, militarily uh, ready is Iran uh, for a nuclear strike? Well, it has to be recalled, of course, that um, Israel actually took out Iran's military, uh, sorry, nuclear capability a couple of decades ago. And I think this was uh, with the full connivance of the United States as well. We Nobody really knows what its capability is, but there is an existential threat. And you know, again, based on past history with Iran, it's an unstable regime. They could well launch a nuclear attack um, and not really, not really care too much about the consequences. Yeah, Alan, I want to uh, ask you exactly the same question, actually, and get your insight into that, particularly given the sort of a uh, growing warm relationship between Russia and Iran. One assumes that Russia must be helping them out on the nuclear front, although they have rather condemned quietly uh, Iran's actions over the weekend. Do you think Iran are close to having a nuclear weapon? I think that given the amount of time that's passed, given the egregious breaches that we've seen and given the assistance of third parties, it is highly likely that Iran has got the capability now to develop <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, a nuclear weapon of some kind. Now, that doesn't mean they will do it, and it doesn't mean they will be able to deploy it. There's a whole separate deployment issue you've got to get over as well in terms of how do you take this very volatile uh, sort of uh, technology and then turn it into an actual weapon. But yes, I think they've probably reached that stage now where we've got a, um, we've got a, a situation of understanding that they're at that level. And that tells us that we're in a very dangerous phase because we don't want them to break out. We don't want them to break out if at all possible. We want there to be a, um, a cessation of this activity and preferably want it to be back into its box. And if the regime refuses to comply, which it hasn't done, then arguably there's a case for taking out the regime to stop it going nuclear. Uh, Alan, oh, uh, excellent words. Uh, and uh, thank you to Paul Smith, the editor of the Jewish Telegraph. Uh, when we come back, Kemi Badenoch has attacked gender cowardice on the part of the police. Find out all about it next. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. She's Alex Phillips.
a very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Cross Talk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and that's Alex Phillips, and he's Dr. Alan Mendoza. Uh, shall we uh, talk about uh, Kemi Badenoch? Uh, she wrote a piece in the uh, Sunday Times yesterday attacking gender ideology and uh, the extent to which it's worryingly taking over the country. I think we all know what we're talking about there. Uh, but uh, she's also, I think, more pertinently attacked various organisations for their cowardice in the face of gender ideology, particularly the police, you know, who tend to be rather sympathetic to the trans voice and less sympathetic to other voices. Uh, your thoughts? Well, I think she's just stating the obvious, isn't she? The obvious that most people in this country understand and know about and are frankly confused as to the tremendous heat and light generated by this topic, which affects a stunningly small number of people in this country and yet appears to be one of the biggest news stories on a regular basis. I think, you know, you need politicians who are going to stand up for the normative position and say, this is just crazy stuff that's going on. We need to be quite clear about the realities of this problem. And can we get the institutions of this country back on side of ordinary people rather than crazy ideologies that wish to ram their ideas down the throats of everyone else? Yeah. yeah, one of the points she was making, that a lot of these independent institutions that have been set up, the quangos, who are supposed to sort of plug into Whitehall but not be politicised, have become hyper-politicised themselves. And I would argue, actually, what's happened at the same time 
his politicians are becoming depoliticized. I did any questions on Friday and I couldn't believe what I heard with the other people on the panel because none of them seem to have a single opinion. They don't scrutinize anything. They don't have any conviction. They certainly don't have any courage in saying anything. The three things you probably need to be a lawmaker in this country, which is to have an opinion, be able to say it and follow it through, are lacking in, in our political class. Well, I think, unfortunately, a lot of politicians now are terrified of speaking their minds. They're absolutely terrified of saying something that might then be construed as somehow being offensive or wrong or racist or anything of that sort of kind. Obviously, we don't want to see racism, etc. But there's you know clear degrees here and people are, should be able to speak their mind uh, within the parameters of civilised society and not be cancelled for it. But it's a terrible problem when your political class... Uh, is looking over its shoulder the whole time, thinking, how will my next statement be addressed? How will people view it? What are the what are going to be the repercussions of me saying this? And I think we should be thankful for people like Kemi Badnock mm. who are happy to stand up for uh, their beliefs and what they think is happening and lambast those who are trying to shut it down. Uh, this is all obviously on the back of the CAS report last week. The CAS re Dr Hilary CAS, a senior paediatrician, uh, who's been looking into the uh, gender ideology issue since 2020. Now, she came up with a load of stuff like, uh, well, here's an idea. Uh, let's not give life-changing drugs to kids who are about nine years old because it's a girl that climbs trees and therefore we think she might be in the wrong body. Maybe not mutilate that child for the rest of it. So everything that uh, Hilary Cass came up with was just so, sort of the thing that normal people have been saying now for years. It was just common sense. And yet, if you said what Hillary Cass said, uh, shall we say, four or five years ago, you'd probably get cancelled. Mm. Well, four or five minutes ago, you'd probably yeah. get cancelled as well <laughs> on that basis. No, but of course it's common sense. And now we've got a, you know, a scholarly review, as it were, to back up the common sense. But it tells you that most people's sense on this is correct, mm. that this is a minor, a very minority issue that shouldn't have the oxygen it has. I don't know how it's taken over the agenda in this way um, and she is suggesting of course that you know there have been major problems in the way that it has been dealt with in this country young people in particular have been left down and those let's not forget are life-changing consequences mm. when did we become a country that rushed willy-nilly into changing people's lives without the science to back it up. I, I, I don't so, understand. You can't even um, get a tattoo at the age of 16, and yet the former head of mermaids took their child at the age of 16 on his uh, on on her or it's 60. I don't know on the 16th birthday to go and be castrated. I mean, it's absolutely mad. That is child abuse, I reckon. Yeah. Uh, and you'll be pleased to know, Alan, that instead of spending money on frontline services, Royal Stoke Hospital have been working instead on a banner featuring flags for no fewer than 21 genders or sexualities. Can you name any of them other than male and female? Demi-romantic. Is that what you are? There's one here. Demi-romantic, genderqueer. That's nice. Uh, polysexual. Uh, are you? Do you fall into any of those categories? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think I'm going to have to investigate now what, what they <laughs> what mean. What demi romantic <laughs> mean? It, it, might, it does sound quite nice, though. Demi romantic. Yeah. It's yeah, sort of like half romantic. I don't look. Th this is this is ridiculous. Why are hospitals spending time and money? on things like this yeah. rather than dealing with the number one issue that their patients would like to see which is efficient f effective service for patients that is what hospitals are there for not to push forward ideological uh, issues like this and yet it seems we have a whole industry dedicated to that now it's like if you go to hospital with your eyeball hanging out you're not exactly looking for the flag which best represents your chosen gender or sexual identity it's utter madness yeah and these uh nhs trusts all moaning about not having enough money uh it's all that anybody in the nhs seems to do even though they get 200 billion quid a year to swill around in uh but uh you know whilst moaning about oh we haven't got enough money you know they, they're, they're shelling out sort of twenty five thousand pounds to turn a zebra crossing into a rainbow crossing mm -hmm. on the road i mean it the, the craziness of the wokery in the NHS, the expensive wokery in the nhs uh is off the scale isn't it yeah and again why is this being allowed to happen what are the priorities who's setting the priorities why are hospitals allowed to go down this route yeah. you know, and not take account of what their patients are actually after? Look, all of us are in favour of people 
being welcome and being welcoming, hospitals being welcoming. But we don't need to go down this route when there are so many manifestly obvious problems with the NHS that need to come first. And that's really, it's about prioritisation and we need to get the show back on the road in that regard. I mean, another element, if you want to talk about uh, NHS and sickness in this country, is the statistics out today, which shows that there are 11 million sick notes issued every year. Uh, that's actually uh, from last year alone, and that has gone up massively. Uh, 2022 to 2023, up from 5.2 million, um, 2015 to 2016. This is equivalent to one in four adults are now off work with a sick note. What's going on? Well, this is a disaster. When we talk about the UK's productivity problem, this is one of the key issues. The uh, sort of people on sick leave, uh, whether it's short term, long term, it seems that we have had an epidemic of this in the past few years. And if we're really serious about improving this country's economic performance, we have to get to the bottom of why so many people are off for so long or for so many times a year and how this can be alleviated so that the economy can get back on its, you know, uh, on its uppers. And right now, I think people are rushing to take advantage of any Thing they might wish if they you know, if, if they want a day off they go and or a few days off they go and claim mental health problems in this regard i'm not for a moment diminishing the reality there are of course mental health problems there of course there are but i think doctors need to be a bit more discerning about this and to provide a bit more reasoning mm -hmm. as to why they give someone a sick note versus why they might not and not simply to succumb to the patient thinks this therefore i'm going to do it it is clear there are certain medical conditions that will need sick notes that's obvious it will clear sometimes that things like depression will need mm. sick notes there's no doubt about that these are real issues that, that hurt. But is it the case that every single sick note in this country has been given for the right reason? I no, strongly it's doubt. Not. One in no, four. it's not. That's the problem. Uh, we're becoming a work shy uh, country, a lazy country, if you ask me, and our brilliant politicians never really thought about it when they brought in free money without having to go to work the furlough scheme uh, for about two years. They never thought about the effect that might have on our nation culturally and it turns out the effect was profound. We've completely changed the way this nation is. Uh, we used to be a hard working nation. I think many, mm. many people now just go, do you oh, know what, joke. I don't really so like working so I, I won't bother. It's costing the NHS yeah. making sure these people um, don't have to work. Right, let's have a look at uh, uh, Donald Trump's on his way to court. Off there he goes. He goes. Why can't these guys ever go around in one car? How many are there? I love how like big the are. <laughs> Just yeah. to no, transport ten, ten would be, one person. Too, too moderate. Who's That's in the enough. other cars? What are they doing? There they go. Uh, anyway, he's on the way to court for the Stormy Daniels case where he's uh, accused of uh, electoral manipulation because he gave her 130 thousand uh, dollars not to talk about their alleged affair which he denies uh, and uh, that is being uh, interpreted mm. as uh, him playing with the public's minds and therefore uh, affecting the uh, election and that's what he stands charged of mm. this is, this trial could go on uh, for eight it's weeks mad. and he has to be there yeah. every day uh, alan what do you think you know in the face of everything that's going on geopolitically when we need a strong america how damaging and injurious is this to the west and to america uh, seeing the guy who's likely to be the next president frankly speaking in court for the next two months well, it is an extraordinary scene, isn't it? I mean, he's the first ex-president to go to court in the first place. He's currently running a presidential campaign to try and be the next president. So, of course, this is an unusual, uh, you know, kind of occurrence that's happening. And it isn't helping, I think, America's fractured political situation and what we can expect uh, in the next coming months from the US political system. Look, that said, you know, we believe in justice in that in that situation. You know, whether we think there's a, a court case or not, and it's happening and therefore justice must take its course. He will defend himself. I think he might come out at the end of this strengthened rather than weakened. It'll depend on what happens at the end, of course. But his supporters may well think that he's being victimised by a political system that's desperate to destroy him at any cost. Look, I say let that court case run you know, let it get over as quickly as possible rather than drag it out. Let's see the outcome and then we can reassess at that point. Mm. Pretty uh, dramatic that, a, 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 that he's not allowed to campaign while he's sitting in the dock. He's got to go every day and he's not allowed to campaign. I mean, uh, when he accuses the uh, Democrats of lawfare, waging war against yeah. him in the courts, you can see where he's coming like from. Uh, Alan, what Thank a fantastic you so much. Thank you Always very much. Alan Mendoza us. from the Henry Jackson Society holding our hands for 60 sizzling minutes. We have 60 sizzling minutes still to come. Hey, You're don't tuned go to Crosstalk. Don't go anywhere.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unbiased and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. She's Alex Phillips. Much coming up in the second hour of this blockbuster show. Uh, this is what's uh, going to be happening in the next hour. Israel's allies have urged the country to avoid any escalation as it considers a response to Iran's unprecedented missile and drone attack. Also, Blinken, you would have missed it. 543 migrants crossed the channel yesterday alone, making that the single biggest crossing, the record for this year. And uh, we've just seen him snaking his way across Manhattan. Donald Trump's long-awaited hush money trial is due to get underway in New York very soon this morning. All of that is coming up and a lot more, so don't go anywhere. But first, let's get to the news headlines with Natalia Horkera. Good afternoon. A bishop and several other people have been injured after a stabbing during a church service in Sydney. Local media reported that the incident took place while a sermon was being streamed online. Police said luckily none of the injuries are life-threatening and that the attacker has been arrested. It is the second mass stabbing to take place in one of Australia's largest cities in the last 48 hours after six people were killed on Saturday. The shopping centre knife attacker deliberately targeted women, police have said. Joel Couchy's father has apologised for his son's actions and says to others he is a monster, but to him he was a very sick boy. 
I'm extremely sorry. I'm heartbroken for you. I, I, look, this is so horrendous that I can't even explain it. You, you're trying to give me to give you an intelligent conversation. I can't do it because I'm just devastated. I love yeah. my son. I made myself a servant to my son when I found out he had a mental illness. I became his servant. I did everything because I love that boy. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, says Iran's attack on Israel was a total failure and is urging Israel not to retaliate. G7 leaders condemn the weekend barrage of missiles and drones, saying they stand in full solidarity to Israel. It is currently unclear how Benjamin Netanyahu plans to respond. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres is urging calm. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. Three men have been killed and one is critically injured after a car crash in North London. Police say they were called to a road traffic accident in Brent Cross late last night. Five men in their 20s were inside the vehicle at the time and no other cars were involved. Donald Trump will enter a New York court later, making him the first U.S. former president in history to stand trial in a criminal case. The 77-year-old is accused of falsifying business records to disguise hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. He could face up to four years in jail if convicted. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty. A leading think tank says a universal credit must change to meet the needs of an older and sicker population. According to the Resolution Foundation, 2.3 million people are now out of work because of poor health. That's nearly double since the benefits scheme was introduced 11 years ago. And an eight-year-old boy from Cumbria has reached Everest Base Camp after setting out with his mum to raise money for charity. Frankie McMillan has been climbing mountains with his mum since he was a toddler. So far, he's scaled over 500 hills and mountains. He's been raising money for a children's charity and hopes to one day be the youngest person to reach the top of Everest. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, we've seen some very wet, very windy weather clearing its way southwards this morning. Much of that has now gone, but instead we'll see showers and some of these will be quite potent too. Indeed, they'll turn wintry over the higher ground of Scotland, parts of Wales and indeed the Pennines. And there's a yellow warning out for strong winds for much of England and Wales, Northern Ireland too. We could see gusts to 50, 55 miles per hour, possibly even 60 miles per hour. Now, it's not going to be a warm day. Temperatures really only just making it into double figures. And with that wind, it'll feel chillier still. And so the course of this evening and overnight, the showers become a little more confined to these eastern areas and towards the north and the west, becoming dry elsewhere. So another cold night to come, potentially sub-zero in parts of the north. But through the course of Tuesday, it's going to be those eastern coasts that stay very cloudy with further rain and uh, showers. These working their way southwards through the course of the day, eventually they come to linger over parts of East Anglia and the southeast. And here, of course, as it stays windy, it will feel very chilly as well. Meanwhile, we start to see some sunshine appearing inland and out towards the west. Temperatures around 13 Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Uh, welcome back. Big story uh, unfolding right now over in Manhattan in New York. Uh, just before the news, we showed you uh, Donald Trump's extraordinary convoy of cars. Uh, we were wondering why it is that uh, important people in America need about 20 cars to carry one person. Uh, it is the way with Donald. Huge convoy, flotilla of cars making their way to the courtroom there uh, where he's answering charges of electoral uh, manipulation insofar as he paid off his alleged lover, the porn star Stormy Daniels, to the tune of 
$130,000 for her to keep quiet about it. Uh, his pro the prosecutors say that was a deliberate effect, uh, attempt to affect the election. You could argue he's just trying to keep something seedy quiet. Uh, he denies that this affair ever happened, Alex, but uh, did give her $130,000. Well, yeah, and we saw, of course, as you said, the cavalcade snaking through Manhattan. We have seen live scenes now of the court. He is due to arrive there any moment. We don't know if he's going to say anything to waiting cameras. If he does, of course, we're going to get that straight to you. But Donald Trump saying uh, in a big speech in a rally over the weekend that this is there to gag him, essentially, to make sure that he can't speak and that he can't campaign. In fact, he cannot campaign at all over the next eight weeks, but he will be dominating news headlines and be, be on television across the world, one assumes. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, don't forget we're asking uh, today, uh, after Iran's massive attack, should Israel retaliate? Do you feel that Israel should militarily retaliate against Iran after those uh, big missile and drone attacks at the weekend, more than 300 on Israel, directly from Tehran. Should Israel retaliate? 0344 499 uh, You can text us, write talk at the beginning of your message, send it to 87222, or you can tweet us at X. Uh, let us know we're at uh, Talk TV there, so let us know what you think. Uh, we're watching the courtroom, waiting for Donald Trump to arrive there in Manhattan ahead of his trial in New York. Uh, uh, but while we wait uh, appropriately, let's go over to America and talk to Rear Admiral Mike Hewitt, Hewitt former US Navy and uh, uh, CEO of IP3. I don't know what that means, but uh, <laughs> hello, Mike. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks very much for joining us. Always good to have you on board. Uh, now, uh, I have been speculating or, or wondering why it is that Israel don't take this chance to uh, take Iran out. Uh, Iran is clearly a lot weaker than Israel. It's certainly a lot weaker than Israel when Israel has uh, the might of the West to be allies with. Uh, what is it that's holding Israel back? Do you expect there to be a retaliation, the retaliation that both Joe Biden and Rishi Sunak are so vehemently advising against. Do you think Netanyahu will retaliate? Well, I think it's important to understand how Netanyahu is looking at this situation. And this is not an isolated event. If you go back to the Obama policy in the early 2000s with Iran, it was one of appeasement, capitulation, rewarding belligerent behavior, giving them tens of billions of dollars, unfreezing their oil assets. And you have to understand you're not dealing with a nation state or somebody that operates in a uh, rule of law fashion. This is a terrorist organization. This is a country being run by fanatical mullahs. And so all of these things will be taken into account by Prime Minister Netanyahu. And my guess is they will prepare a response, a series of response, responses for consideration by their war cabinet and that's what they're doing this afternoon um i really am disappointed in this kind of dovish response so far to israel they have every right to protect their nation from this type of an attack and so i would like to see us address this not from an israeli perspective but an iranian perspective and what should we be doing to isolate iran further to snap back the sanctions to freeze their assets to freeze those tens of billions of dollars that we promised them, to cut off their use of oil in the international market. That is how we need to address Iran. And absent that, I think Israel is going to have to take unilateral action. Do you think that, I mean, the, the, the mood music coming out of the EU, for example, day, uh, unfortunately, is nothing like that. Uh, Joseph Burrell, they are meeting, of course, the um, security chiefs in Brussels during the course of this week to decide what should be done. But the mood music coming out of Joseph Burrell so far, who said of their external action service, has been, well, let's not even talk about sanctions. And yet we look at how many European parts have been in the Iran Iranian drones that not only did they use themselves against Israel over the weekend, but they've been flogged 
clogging to Russia. Uh, we also know, of course, that Iran's been backing, curating, funding the terrorist organizations Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthi rebels disrupting all the cargo in the Red Sea. Should this not potentially be an opportunity now, a, a green light, if you will, for the West to say to Iran, enough is enough, and start taking out some sort of strategic military headquarters? Um, or are we worried because perhaps they've actually, you know, gone so far as to have a nuclear weapon? Well, I think you're exactly right. And remember, we're resourcing those proxy networks to the Iranians. And then the Iranians are funneling those same resources to Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis. They're attacking our commerce in the Red Sea. They obviously were orchestrated the Hamas attack on Israel in October. And what they're doing is, that, is they are creating this kind of friction in, in the region for a very simple reason, to chase out America and to destroy Israel. And if you don't continue to emphasize that is their strategic goals, then you'll make short-sighted decisions. I believe we should absolutely go back to sanctioning the Iranians. The core of this, and you just touched on it, Alex, was the Iran nuclear deal back in the early 2000s that Obama orchestrated with the UK, Germany, and France. And in reality, what we did is we set a legal pathway for the Iranians to get to a weapon of mass destruction. And by the way, we're on the ninth year of that 10-year deal. I am very concerned about Iran's ability to at least demonstrate that they have the capacity to develop a nuclear weapon. And that may be their response to the current situation. Uh, yeah, Mike, is there, apart from the possibility that uh, Iran has a nuclear deterrent, has nuclear power in terms of uh, weaponry, apart from that, would there be any reason for Israel not to just attack Iran. I mean, Israel is very fond of saying Iran is the bad guy. It's behind everything bad that happens in the uh, Middle East. And I think they're right. Uh, why not just take this opportunity to take Iran out? Well, I think that's probably one of the considerations that they're that they're making. But there's obviously a whole stratification of attacks that can that can be done. I don't think regime change is on the table, so to speak, in Iran. So they may be looking at targeting some military bases some command and control uh, organizations in the country, the IRGC, obviously, and then potentially taking out their nuclear capacity. If I was advising Netanyahu right now, I would take a different approach. I would say, let's not have a direct confrontation with Iran. Let's go back to why we need to defeat Hamas. Let's go back to pushing for the military aid that we need to win that war against Hamas. Let's further isolate Iran on the world stage with our allies. That is the approach I would take if I were Netanyahu right now. Why do you think that th this has not been done? I cannot seem to wrap my head around how on earth we've got ourselves into a situation where uh, Western countries, the UK included actually, through a British firm with a subsidiary in Poland, have been selling things to Iran that they're using to build their weapons. I mean, the UK is responsible for selling lots of optical goods. Now, I don't think that everyone in Iran suddenly has myopia and needs laser treatment. I'd imagine and some of those optical goods have ended up in the drones and in surveillance equipment. But actually, when you look at the sort of things that we have been selling, when I say we, I mean the Western world in general, to Iran, it actually sends a chill down one's spines. For example, the last trade data that we've got, the European Union in 2022 sold a billion dollars worth of machinery and nuclear reactors to Iran. That was the top exported product. I mean, is this just being utterly myopic and being chased around? around the boardroom by greedy, uh, you know, tech companies who want to make a sale and the EU seeing only that? Or is there some sort of strange collusion? I cannot fathom this when there's such a noise about 0.1% of Israel's arsenal coming from Britain, which amounts to a button in a command centre. I, I am shocked as well. We all know that China and Russia and North Korea have been resourcing Iran for its terrorist activities in the region. They obviously have also resourced Iran to then support the Russians back against Ukraine with drones and technologies to develop those drones. These 300 drones that were launched against Israel, I can only assess that most of the components that were in those drones were commercial off the shelf. They weren't military supplies, and most of them came from Western allies. We absolutely have to get in front of this new type of warfare because right now it's operating unfettered 
by any type of sanction or ITAR compliance, and recognizing that what Iran is doing right now is flexing its muscles because we gave them the opportunity to do it. These fanatical mullahs that run this country are running it as a revolution, and they have a clear-sighted picture to chase America out. So the more that we resource Iran, and then the more they can act as belligerent supporters of China and Russia in the activities as proxies, um, the larger this problem will become. And Israel, who understands this better than anybody, understands when they need to take action against Israel. We gave our guarantee to Israel and our allies in the Middle East that we would not allow Iran to get to a nuclear weapon. Well, our word has never been good in this regard. Look at North Korea, look at many other countries, look at Libya, look at Iraq when we invaded them, when they didn't even have WMD. We have a terrible non-proliferation policy right now. And I am gravely concerned that Israel will have to take unilateral action simply because of what the JCPOA or the Iran nuclear deal gave the Iranians because they are literally at a breakout point right now. Mm. Uh, Mike, it seems obvious that uh, uh, Netanyahu is, uh, shall we say, circumspect about any advice or instructions that he gets from Joe Biden. I think he takes what Joe Biden says with a pinch of salt, uh, but obviously has to take it slightly seriously, but uh, not as seriously as he should. Meanwhile, uh, the president specifically told Iran in terms of their potential plans to attack Israel this weekend. One word, he said, don't. And they ignored him. So what I'm getting at is, can you explain what the implications are for this very unstable re region when we have uh, the weakest president in living memory whom no one is listening to? Not only do we have a weak president and a weak administration, it was the same administration going all the way back to Obama. And many of the same folks that advised Biden advised Obama it was the same small group of people that set the conditions for this to happen, to give the Iranians the chance to sell oil in the market, giving them a legal pathway to a nuclear weapon. And for whatever reason, the Obama administration decided to side with the Shia of Iran, and specifically the mullahs, in its Middle East policy. And what we have today is not just weakness or dovish behavior or not standing up to your word, this is the same thing we did in Syria when we drew the red line on the chemical weapons with Assad. We absolutely don't back up our rhetoric. And, and that's what the Iranians see, and that's what the Israelis see. And so I don't only see us as weak on the world stage. I believe we set the conditions for the conflict that we're looking at right now. Now, it, uh, uh, those who are watching us online, uh, rather than listening on the radio, we are playing live pictures of the court in Manhattan where Donald Trump is due to arrive at any moment uh, for his trial, expected to last eight weeks, the Stormy Daniels affair. Uh, Mike, that is quite significant. It's an interesting juxtaposition to have you on talking about weakness when it comes to Iran. At the same time, we're about to see the former president of the United States appear in court because arguably it was Donald Trump who, first of all, established the Abraham Accords, the normalization of relations between Israel and neighboring countries such as the UAE and Saudi. And interesting, of course, to see those countries aiding and abetting the UK and the US to intercept that drone and missile strike from Iran at the weekend. Um, but at the same time, of course, it was Donald Trump who said, right, this Iran nuclear deal ain't worth the paper it's written on. They're proliferating uranium. That's being ripped up. It's done. And here we are at a moment of crisis ever since that thing was brought back to the table by Biden. And the man who actually probably made the most sense on this is going to be locked up in court for the next eight weeks. What's your reaction to that? Well, I think as a matter of undermining Western democracies, watching it play out on the world stage, which is what you're referring to right now, this is really what we need to understand that the Chinese and the Russians want to replace the West as the authoritarian powers in charge. And when you see issues like this imploding in our country and in the UK with our government, it feeds right into this, to this narrative. I do find it very ironic that even yesterday, the Biden administration was blaming Donald Trump for the Iranian attack on Israel because he did walk away from the Iran nuclear deal when in fact it was the Iran nuclear deal that they created that set the conditions for the attack that happened two days ago. And potentially even worse, the Iranians as a terrorist organization have a pathway to a nuclear weapon. It was Donald Trump that walked away from that deal 
And despite that, the Iranians have continued to enrich uranium to a very high level. Um, no one has really checked them. They have kicked out all the IAEA inspectors. And so what President Trump did on his watch was exactly what needed to be done, which was to isolate Iran from the rest of the region, create an economic and a commercial entanglement with the Abraham Accords. And I believe this, as soon as he becomes the president again, and I think he will, you will see the Saudis and the Israelis complete their bilateral agreements. You will see the Abraham Accords come back into full functionality. And I believe the isolation of Iran will ultimately choke off the mullahs. Uh, last question, Mike. What do the American people want? What do the American people expect of their president in this situation? Are they behind Israel? Are they behind the Palestinians? Uh, where do the majority of Americans stand on this? Because I think that's an important factor because, of course, uh, Mr. Biden is in electoral mode. Uh, tell us what, uh, where America stands. I, I can only say this, that the vast number of Americans are 100 percent behind Israel and 100 percent behind the Jewish people here in America and in Israel against their fight against Iran. You have pockets of resistance, and much of it has been amplified by social media that I believe the Chinese and the Russians are behind in pockets of areas such as Minnesota and very pro-Palestinian segments of our country. And unfortunately, they have a very loud voice because this is an election year. And so what really frightens me is when our commander in chief, be Republican or Democrat, use polling or talking to the American people with respect to national security, and then to throw your weight into the Congress and say, you tell me what I should do. The commander in chief has executive powers to defend our nation, and he needs to exercise those powers the way the American people have given them to him. And right now, I think the American people are very concerned about our weakness on the world stage. Yeah, American and British people, both uh, Rear Admiral Mike Hewitt, fantastic to have you Thanks, back Mike. on the programme, talking so much sense. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, without doubt, we'll be uh, waiting for Donald Trump to see if he says anything on his arrival at court in New York. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey. Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. She's Alex Phillips. We've currently got our cameras trained on the courtroom <laughs> doors in Manhattan, waiting for Donald Trump to arrive. We're, help, we're told he's somewhere in the environs of the court. Uh, he's ready to uh, face trial uh, for his hush money, alleged hush money payments to the porn star Storm, Stormy Daniels, who she says they had an affair. He says they didn't. He did pay her $130,000 to keep quiet about whatever the hell happened. Uh, now it's in court because the state of New York says that he may have affected uh, the American presidential election by keeping this bombshell news quiet. So uh, welcome right. to and they're, America. They're not uh, trying to affect the current uh, American yeah. electoral yeah. campaign by having him in court. Yeah. Uh, on our big story of the day, though, following the bombardment or attempted bombardment of Israel by Iran over the weekend after their so-called massive attack that uh, failed, although it was uh, pretty horrible if uh, it had succeeded. We've been asking, should Israel retaliate? And a number of you have been texting us and tweeting us. Amanda says Israel is in an impossible situation where their very existence is at stake. Long has it been, Amanda? She says it is Iran that the world needs to focus on. I'd agree with that one. Uh, Roy in Devon says the idiotic Ayatollahs have made themselves very vulnerable prime targets. Uh, they must know Israel have accurate information about their locations. It will only be a matter of time. Now, someone else anonymous has messaged us saying you are asking the nation's opinion on whether Israel should retaliate. But why are you glossing over the fact that Iran retaliated after Israel bombed their embassy first? Well, actually, we have been talking about that. And I think it's important to point out that, yes, they did indeed bomb what is called, uh, again, what's anti-protocol, really, what is considered sort of foreign soil abroad. Mm -hmm. um, but who did they bomb? Who were they taking out? The leader, the general of the Quds Force. Now, this is the guy who basically funds, arms, trains and curates all of the horrible terrorist organisations, the Iranian proxies, Hamas. Hezbollah, the Houthis. So isn't it not a good thing that he's no longer with us? Uh, indeed. A final, a final text. Uh, this is from Kate uh, about should uh, Israel retaliate. Kate says, no to retaliation. It's too dangerous for the rest of the world. Well, I'm afraid... Uh, that countries tend mm. to think about themselves rather than well, the rest of the world. One could argue it's too dangerous not to retaliate. If you, you could keep, do I mean, that. people keep talking about proportionality. They don't. They they talk about oh well, look at what Israel's doing in Palestine after October the seventh. All Israel did was take out this terrorist chief, and uh, they had three hundred missiles and, and drones heading towards them. So if you want to talk about a proportionality, maybe look at that instead. Indeed, and let's talk about. Uh, Proportionality now uh, with our next guest, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, the excellent Jake Wallace Simons. Thanks for joining us, uh, Jake. Uh, for, uh, uh, hang on a second. No, uh, Jake, are you there? I am here. Okay. Uh, so, a, a uh, will. Oh, could you bear with us for just a second, Jake? Uh, Donald Trump is just arriving at court. We'll be with him one second. Uh, there he is, Alex, arriving yeah. with his uh, trademark massive tie. Yeah. I'd, is he going to say anything? Here he goes. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. There's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. And it's a country that's failing. 
It's a country that's run by an incompetent man who's very much involved in this case. This is really an attack on a political opponent. That's all it is. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs> So, well, there you go, Donald Trump saying that this court case is nothing more than an attack on a political opponent. He has uh, called this uh, a sort of onslaught of court cases against him, political lawfare. Indeed, this is the only trial that he will face ahead of the elections. It's expected to last eight weeks, during which time he is unable to campaign. But I think one thing is for certain, you can't shut him up. He will be dominating news headlines for the next two months, yeah, without yeah. a doubt. There he was, not campaigning. No, he was not campaigning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think we're going to get some Donald Trump-style non-campaigning. What a mad uh, So we'll keep you up to, up to speed with that story as it develops. Uh, let's go back to Jake Wallace Simon there. Sorry about that, uh, Jake, but everything stops for Trump, as you well know. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, I was in the process of asking you two-pronged question, really. A, will Israel retaliate militarily uh, to the Iran attack? And B, should Israel do that? Yeah, I think the best way to consider this is imagine if 300 ballistic missiles, cruise missiles and drones were launched at London. Imagine if we had air defences bolstered by the US that shot them down. But then as soon as the coast was clear, the message from the, uh, from the Americans on the world stage publicly was Britain, don't retaliate, don't do anything. Let's call that a win. I mean, that's not a win. You know, uh, defending yourself and only, you know, seven missiles getting through and a one 10 year old girl being critically injured. That's not a win. A win is effective deterrence uh, and winning an actual war. That would be a win. So I think that uh, this is the reality that Israel is perversely enough living with where this sort of aggression can be targeted at it. And yet the world's calling for it not to respond, but it has to respond because the way to stop further attacks like this in the future is obviously to put in place a proper deterrent. Iran is only doing this because it thinks it can get away with it. It wants to establish a new normal whereby no retaliation or no meaningful retaliation is launched at it when it tries this sort of thing. And frankly, I do think that it would only do it under the Biden administration. If you think back to 2020, when Donald Trump, who you've just seen on trial, uh, was in charge in the White House, um, he authorised the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Ira uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guards, who was a far more iconic and famous figure than those killed by the Israelis in Syria the other day. And yet the Iranians did not dare to mount any kind of significant response at all because they thought that Trump you know, ha w was possibly a madman who would take them out because America can take them out. The American military is so much bigger than the Iranian military. Uh, in fact, you know, if we compare defense budgets, the American defense budget is $850 billion compared to Iran's $9 billion. Its Navy is four times bigger. Its Air Force is 13,000 planes versus Tehran's 551. That's before we even count the Israeli might as well. So deterrent is possible. Deterrent is necessary if we want to stop this thing happening again. But with Biden's uh, rhetoric, trying to restrict the Israelis from responding properly, uh, you know, if the Israelis don't respond, then the Iranians will be rubbing their hands together and, uh, and laughing to themselves because it means that they know they can get away with this again and again and again. Well, what Iran have said is, uh, OK, this matter is now settled. I wonder how much of this was theatrics, given they said, oh, we're sending our drones over. They'll be with you in about uh, eight hours. Enough time for you to intercept. Um, but they said, well, look, if you now respond again to Israel, we will double what we did last time. And you know what we mean rather perilously. Do you think they're alluding that they might have some sort of nuclear capability? Is that just saber rattling or could they? Is that what is potentially giving the West the willies about not actually using what Iran have done as a green light to go in there and say enough is enough back in your box and strategically taking out certain uh, facilities, uh, uh, military facilities, potentially nuclear facilities? I think it's quite possible that the Iranians are nuclear armed. They certainly uh, either have or are but a week away from having enough, enough fissile material for one bomb. They may have already enough for three, according to some reports. Um, and, uh, and the weaponization of that, i.e. forming the uranium uh, into a, onto a warhead and making it shootable, as it were, uh, will, will take a short time. So if intelligence assessments are incorrect, we know the Iranians have pulled the wool over our eyes before, then they could already indeed be nuclear armed. But let's get this in perspective. 
America has the most significant nuclear arsenal in the world. Uh, the Israelis have never officially uh, confirmed or denied if they are nuclear armed, but they are widely believed to be nuclear armed. Uh, both of their combined forces are dwarf the uh, Iranian capabilities. Iran does not have an Iron Dome. It does not have significant uh, missile defense systems uh, on the scale that Israel has. If the West turned against Iran and actually, as you say, put it back in its box, it would be defeated. There's, difficult, there's, there's no two ways about it. Now, of course, let's not be simplistic about this. Uh, we've got to think about Russia and China as well, taking opportunity of such a war to come in and uh, further their, their objectives, invading Taiwan in the case of Russia or pushing into NATO countries in the case of, of, of Russia. And those are serious considerations. I don't want to make light of that. But the fact is that the Iranian, what the Iranians are trying to do is to deter the Israelis from further action. And if that uh, and if uh, that is their goal, and if that is successful, it will mean that they have the strategic upper hand. And the Americans, unfortunately, are by putting by putting pressure on the Israelis not to retaliate, are serving the interests of Iran in enforcing this deterrent upon Israel, making Israel think twice about whether it responds. Whereas it should be the Iranians having to think twice before they do anything, because they, let's not forget, are the aggressor here. They are the ones who are, who are fermenting unrest around the region, who've ringed Israel with these proxy militias from Hezbollah to the Houthis that are causing so much trouble and bloodshed around the region. And of course, are conducting or trying to conduct assassination plots on our shores in Britain and working against us and our way of life. One security official told me that the Iranian threat in Britain was what kept him up at night above any other threat. So they are our enemy as much as they are Israel's enemy. And we need to make sure that they feel deterred mm. rather than the West feeling deterred by these mad mullahs and their empty threats. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Jake, uh, excellent to talk to you as yeah, always. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Jake, what is Simon's One there? week away from having a nuclear weapon, potentially. I mean, that is chilling. Perhaps what we've got here is, you know, the American foreign policy has been to tell newspapers what they're going to do before they do it. Perhaps we're actually snapping back into proper yeah. front-footed war mode. The way I see it is that the rest of the world, Britain, America, uh, countries all over the world, it, it would be quite handy if Israel did not respond, if they did not retaliate. But as Jake mm. quite rightly mm said put yourself in uh, right. uh, the Israeli population's shoes how would you feel it if some foreign power had just rained more than 300 missiles down onto London mm. would you feel okay about our government doing nothing about it yeah. I don't think you would yeah uh, I think they will respond mm -hmm. now we've still got lots coming up we're going to be looking at the uh, Donald Trump chart uh, and uh, uh, we're going to be looking at the Donald trial uh, Donald Trump trial in America again in a little while with Greg Swenson. But first, uh, uh, one other big story cropped up today. Uh, 500 of uh, 534 uh, illegal migrants came across the English Channel yesterday. That is a record for the year. Uh, that now puts our arrivals for 2024 at a record 6,265. Of course, the weather was very nice over the weekend. So if we have a clement summer, I know that's a long shot uh, with Britain, but if it's a sunny, uh, windless su summer, uh, God knows how many of these oh, people... It'll be basically a travelator from Calais to Thousands and thousands Ridiculous. will come across. Uh, let's talk to the executive director of Migration Watch UK, uh, Dr. Mike Jones. Uh, hello, Mike. Hi, good to be here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, another day, another uh, record number of people coming over, but 534 yesterday. We know very nice conditions, sunny, no wind, uh, mill pond seas. So they came across. Now, we're coming into the summer now. We're going to get lots of days like yesterday. Uh, I mean, the mind boggles as to how many... Uh, migrants will come across the channel because they seem to be doing so right now with almost total impunity. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, the, the weather has more of a, a role in the number of people crossing than the government does, which says much about uh, the, the power of the nation state over this. And yeah, the, the numbers could increase exponentially over the summer period. You know, as you say, we're going to have clement weather conditions. And, um, you know, once those risks of crossing are reduced, you're just going to have more and more people attempting the journey. And uh, it just adds to a, a situation that's completely out of control. This will impose costs on the taxpayer. 
uh, and there is an obvious national security risk associated with illegal migration as well. But, you know, a, a bad situation is getting worse. Yeah, I wanted to ask about just that, in fact, given how unstable we are internationally at the moment, everything going on in the Middle, Re Middle East. Of course, all the charities and handringers would have us all believe that everyone coming over on boats are poor refugees and war-torn countries. It's all our fault. We probably started those wars somehow, so we must offer them some form of refuge. But uh, every now and then we get uh, figures coming out of who the cohorts are on these boats squeaked out after the fact. But do we know, with the latest arrivals, who they are and who are organising these crossings well we don't really know who they are because the, the vast majority the vast vast majority destroy the documents uh but we know you know from administrative administrative data and peer-reviewed academic evidence in the nordic countries that you do get large numbers of people from the middle east and sub-saharan africa committing certain crimes in a disproportional way so, you know, what has happened overseas in Europe may well happen over here. So there's a definite security risk involved there. Because, um, you know, my economics is fundamental to migration, uh, you know, fiscal impacts, housing, public services, and all the rest of it. But you also change the composition of your population and the nature of it. And, you know, there's a, there's a whole sort of cultural issue and argument to be made there. And there are all sorts of long-term risks here to the UK if this situation is allowed to persist. Uh, indeed. Now, uh, the Rwanda scheme, of course, is supposed to discourage migrants from coming <laughs> across the uh, channel. Doesn't seem to be working. Uh, however, uh, you know, whether or not the Rwanda scheme actually gets off the ground, apparently the Prime Minister is negotiating with some other countries to get schemes going there. Uh, they are Armenia, Ivory Coast, Costa Rica and Botswana. Uh, will any of these uh, potential deals make any difference in terms of discouraging migrants coming across the channel? Because the spectre of the Rwanda scheme doesn't seem to have discouraged them one bit. In fact, the numbers are going up and up. Uh, I, I think it was Albert Einstein who was once credited with saying the definition of, you know, insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And yeah. this is a, you know, a classic case study in this. The fact is the Rwanda plan has been challenged in the courts. The High Court ruled in favour of the government. The Court of Appeal ruled against the government and the Supreme Court upheld the decision of the Court of uh, Appeal. Um, so it was shot down in the courts. Um, now, if you think these alternative outsourcing schemes won't be challenged by the legal system, then, you know, you're in for a rude awakening. It's for the birds. I mean, you know, take uh, Co Costa Rica. Costa Rica has a pretty good human rights record. But I mean, if, if you look at on the US State Department website, there are issues there with, you know, prison overcrowding, um, free trial detention. There are issues with Botswana, with freedom of speech and so on. I mean, obviously, you have those issues in this country, but mm -hmm. that doesn't matter to the human rights lawyers. The, the fact is, there's enough there for them to make a case that these are unsafe countries. It's incompatible with the Human Rights Act which by extension means it's incompatible with the European Convention of Human Rights. So what the Tory party needed to do was look at the domestic legal system, you know, amend or abolish the Human Rights Act. You could replace it with something else, quite possibly, but they needed to set that groundwork and lay those foundations so that if you do want to negotiate a returns policy, whether it's to a third country like Rwanda or a, a, to a country of origin, then you can actually go ahead with that. But they yeah. didn't do that. Uh, Dr. Well, Mike Jones, great, uh, great to did. talk to you. <laughs> Executive Director of Migration Watch UK there, Mike Jones. Thank you, Mike. Uh, when we come back, uh, we'll be talking about the Donald mm. again with our friend Greg Swenson. Uh, she's Alex Phillips. I'm I Kevin. used to be. <laughs> That's the <laughs> I remains. Think I still am. That's the remains of Alex Phillips. Alex O'Sullivan there. I'm Kevin Phillips. He's a footballer, <laughs> isn't he? Uh, we'll be back in just a little while. Stay tuned to Crosswork. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker.
Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Crosstalk. She's Alex Phillips. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And guess who's in the studio? It is the one and only Greg Swenson. He is from uh, the Republican Overseas Organization here in London. Uh, but all eyes, Greg, are on uh, New York right now. Uh, the the ex-president, uh, possibly future president, Donald Trump, has just turned up. Uh, he's been told he's got to sit there for eight weeks for this Stormy Daniels trial uh, and not campaign at all. He went into the court campaigning. Uh, so I don't, th I don't think uh, 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 that uh, Trump will particularly stay silent on the campaigning front. Yeah. Uh, but it is lawfare, isn't it? It is taking oh, totally. him out of the it's, equation. It's the ultimate election interference, yeah. you know, for sure. And, and, and definitely the weaponization of the justice system, there's no doubt. And I think voters see that. You know, they, this is the most absurd of the four indictments. And so in many ways, it's good for Trump that it's coming first yeah. because it'll, it'll kind of make voters skeptical of the other indictments, which which might have a little more meat on the bone or have a little bit more credibility. But this one lacks, uh, completely lacks credibility. It's the weakest of the it, lot. It isn't really it? is. Yeah. It's, it's really obscene. The, the problem here, I mean, Kevin was saying about the O.J. Simpson trial after that ne'er-do-well passed away last week and saying that it's jury your, selection... It's your word of the day. Ne'er-do-well. You said it ne'er-do-well about 20 well, times. Ne'er, I love the word ne'er-do-well. <laughs> I keep meaning to overuse the word nary, which I think has yeah. fallen out of circulation. What about scallywags? How oh, about I like that, scallywags. That Alex, yeah. only after he dedicated the rest of his life to finding the, the true real killer. So yeah, I, 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 yeah. I don't know if that was <laughs> He is so much. Yeah. Such, <laughs> such a shame they never found him. Wasn't yeah. they? But, yeah. but Kev was saying the importance of jury selection yeah. in an American trial, which will be happening right now for the Trump case. And it seems to me that, um, you know, it's almost like rigging an election in miniature format, it, isn't it? it? Really, Make sure the jury is all sort of pro-Democrat and then you got it. It's 88% of the, of the jury pool in New York voted for Biden. 
It, right, I mean, there is no chance he's getting a fair trial. So not so, only is it election interference, but they've prevented him from his, his constitutional right to a fair trial by running four indictments at almost simultaneously, um, which makes it impossible for him, him to defend himself properly. But also, yes, you're right, Alex, this, the jury pool there really favors the, um, the Alvin Bragg, the prosecutor. So I wouldn't be surprised, as obscene as this case is, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a couple of convictions. And then what then? What if he does? Well, then he'll win on appeal. There's no doubt. I mean, the, 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 you could shoot so many holes in this case. It's a real stretch legally. So, but it doesn't mean that they won't have a friendly jury that, that will convict. So, I mean, but then again, it only takes one juror to, to, uh, to vote to acquit. So, you know, there's a chance that, that you know, better heads prevail, but you know, this is a hostile jury pool for sure. I mean, it, technically, he could get four and a half years in jail for this. I yeah. mean, do you think they for go? Each one. Do you it, suppose he gets found guilty? Do you think they go so far as to actually I, put him behind bars? I, I wouldn't put anything past the Democrats. No, I wouldn't They've either. lost their minds, you know. And I mean, the fact that that they're trying to put their political opponent in jail for what traditionally has been a misdemeanor, so it's a completely obscene. And and at the same time, prosecutor the prosecutor Alvin Bragg is lowering felony charges to misdemeanors for violent criminals yeah. in New York. That's yeah, what, yeah, one of the reasons yeah. New York is so dangerous and why cops are being killed. So, you know, this is, it just shows you the sheer hypocrisy of it. And, and remember also that Alvin Bragg ran on the campaign theme of get Trump. So it, it's, it just shows you the, the, as I said earlier, the, the weaponization of the justice system. I would argue, you know, six months ago, I would discuss with, with you both that, this was really helping him in the nomination process, mm -hmm. but I thought it might hurt him in the general. I'm not so sure of that anymore. I think I think voters are smart enough to see through this. But how much is, is this going to have ramifications around the world when, you know, just over the weekend, we have seen one of the scariest sort of, you know, situations sure. geopolitically that's happened in a generation, I would say. If, if, I think if even one of those missiles had landed fully in Israel, we would be seeing big, big crisis right sure. now unfolding and yet of course the person who made it safe in the middle east was donald trump through right. the abraham accords i think yeah. when we saw the arabic countries all come together and actually work together with the west to defend israel right. that is the direct result of what he did in the region and they have it exactly the same time biden saying no 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 don't retaliate don't right. do anything biden of course bringing back that wretched nuclear deal that uh, trump had torn up sure. the very same time we've got the man responsible for making the world a safer place in the dock. Right, and, and that just shows you the, the, the sh sheer absurdity of this whole thing. And, and, you know, I think over the weekend, this, the geopolitical challenges in the Middle East probably helped Trump in the election, because as, as you pointed out, he, you know, orchestrated or engineered the Abraham Accords. Biden came in day one, took the, the Houthis off of the terrorism list. Oh. He, he stopped enforcing the embargo on Iran, which put billions and billions, probably $60 billion in the pockets of the mullahs. He shut down the energy sector in the U.S. as best as he could, which you know basically caused prices to go up. So who, who's everyone buying oil from? Iran and, and the Russians, right? So you know the, the, the policy, the energy policy of, of Biden has been as much as a disaster mm. as his direct foreign policy. Okay, we haven't got long to go, Greg, but uh, can Trump uh, cash in on Biden's weakness? I mean, Biden yeah. is palpably uh, an incredibly weak president Without who is doubt. performing extremely weakly yeah. in the Middle East. And weakness breeds aggression. I think Americans, the majority of Americans support Israel. They want to see a tough president uh, over there and they're not seeing it. That's got to play well for Trump, hasn't uh, Absolutely. 67% of Americans are, want to support Israel. Um, and, and Biden has done everything in his power to, you know, sometimes he supports them. He's tried to say the right things over the weekend. Yeah. But then, then again, he's told them not to retaliate, to take the win, uh, quote unquote. And so, you know, that's not leadership. And that's surely not helping with the, any kind of peace through strength or, you know, or, or any sort of um, deterrence sure. rather mm. than appeasement. He's been appeasing from day one, tried to get back into the JC, JCPOA. The Houthis, the Houthis I mentioned, he's mm. he's just demonstrated weakness. Well, he's at every, uh, basically every time. made this situation, one could argue. Yeah. Greg, um, Swenson, Greg, thank, thank you so, so much. Uh, that's about it for today.
Uh, you've been a wonderful audience. I've been uh, Kevin O'Sullivan. I've been Alex Phillips. Uh, Ian Collins is up next. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place, 9.30 a.m. Me and Alex, Kevin, Alex. Uh, so have a great afternoon. Thank you for watching. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 